I am Michelle Graves, and welcome to today's segment of The Power of Money. And in my last show, I had as my guest, attorney Richard West, who has been a practicing specialist in the field of bankruptcy for over 30 plus years in the Ohio marketplace. Um, because of the content of what we were talking about in our last show, I asked him if we could do another show to end this subject completely, which is we have vetted it, we've talked about it, we looked at scenarios that could benefit you or your family members or your church members or your, your club members. I mean, you have no idea how many people are drowning right now. I don't care about the unemployment numbers. I don't care how many people are working jobs. The jobs are not paying well and people are struggling. They're struggling because they are in debt. They didn't come out of the last recession depression of 2008 and we're still there. And again, um, not to get on a bandwagon, but bankruptcy is your first step on your road to financial recovery. And in 2018, which is right around the corner, that's what I want on your agenda. I want you to come up out of this. I want you to be on the road to financial recovery. And so it starts with, for many of us, I didn't say all, for those of you who are blessed, amen. But there's a whole bunch of people that are floundering. And this is, an out, uh, uh, this is a viable, realistic alternative to getting your life back on point and to handling your financial affairs responsibly. And as I said in my last show, I'm going to say it again today, please do not talk about bitcoins to me. <laughs> please, as the money lady, don't do it. Don't do it. I'll talk about it next year about bitcoins. But when you're drowning, don't talk about the, the lottery. Don't. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> Attorney West. Thank you for having me back. I, I appreciate thank it. you so much for being back. And if you don't mind, if we could uh, rewind for the benefit of those who did not hear the first show, uh, some of the talking points or highlights that you would like to emphasize to our uh, viewers mm. regarding bankruptcy, what it is, what it isn't, and just some of the highlights. Be happy to. One of the things that we talked about was the uh, a representative couple who would come in with all kinds of financial problems. And we talk about how we would look at the different options. Credit counseling, financial management programs, debt arbitration, those kinds of things in addition to the bankruptcy options because as you said, bankruptcy is not the option for everybody. It's not the right answer for every situation. So in order for someone to really find out what's the best option for them. They have to look at all the options. If none of the non-bankruptcy options make sense, then we need to look at what is bankruptcy all about. Most people have a, a, a preconceived idea that bankruptcy is somehow bad. It means that they have failed somehow and they need to really reframe that. And the way I suggested in the, the last episode is let's look at it from a business standpoint. Your family really is a business, actually, it if is. you think about it that way. And if you had a business where the business manager was making bad decisions, paying debts that shouldn't be paid and ignoring important issues, well, we'd fire that manager and get a new one that mm -hmm. would make the right decisions. Right. We need to take that same sort of approach to our own families. <clears throat> if our income is such that we can only take care of certain needs, we have to put family first. Family needs come first. If we don't have enough money to pay the, the, mm -hmm. the credit cards or the interest on the credit cards, then we need to find a way not to do that. And bankruptcy is the way the federal law says to not pay your bills. In fact, we talked about the median income for a family size of four is $83,500. If you're making that or less, federal law presumes that you shouldn't be paying your bills. How about that? I mean, Don't pay isn't your bills. that when you told me that, <coughs> it was just like, bing, it makes sense because my background in, as a banker and as an economist, the numbers have to make sense. And, and I look at people's after-tax income and I'm like, I, you, you, you can't 
do this. It, right. it, it can't ha You can try it, but you, it's not sustainable. Sustainability is the key. <coughs> Excuse me. Because you can borrow money mm -hmm. and you can move balances between credit cards and you can take out payday loans and you can skip Car a title. payment yeah. and, and, and you can do all of those things, but it's not fixing the problem. And it's real easy to figure out. All you need to do is get a calculator and a sheet of paper. This is my income after taxes. Mm -hmm. These are my living expenses, my rent or house payment, my car payment. And like we talked about in the last uh, show, a lot of people are not taking into consideration health care expenses. The, oh my the gosh. deductible on right. insurance. The deductible. That needs to be figured in right. there too. So when you get finished with your math exercise, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, it's not complicated. <clears throat> Addition and subtraction, there's no higher math here. <clears throat> if there's not enough money left over to get you out of debt in one to three years, mm -hmm. then you need a different approach. Well, I think, and again, I'd like to reiterate for the, for the benefit of those who missed the first episode, and for those of you that did, you can always go to YouTube, type in The Power of Money, type in his name, my name, and the first episode will come up. You'll be able to watch it in, in real time and it will help you to get some good foundation. But I think that the whole discussion, as I shared with you, I wear many hats in the market. Uh, one of them is as a employee benefit advisor. And one of the shocks for me was I did do the math with people that I sat down with. Mm. And I concluded that they could not afford to be sick. Right. They're done. The deductibles. I don't think people even understand what that means once you cross into the road of I have a sickness that I can't get better or I have a heart attack or a stroke or I have this or I have high blood pressure and all of these conditions that get worse as you get older um, if you don't have adequate escrow money to pay for all of this stuff um, you're going to be out the back door now, I don't think that the the reality of the new healthcare world has uh, hit most of us. I, I don't think <clears throat> it has. I don't think it has. And what it means for your industry uh, as bankruptcy professionals, because I believe that within this next 2018, we're going to see more and more people floundering. And I think it's going to be a banner year for your industry because the light bulb is going to go click. And that is that the numbers don't work. They don't work. Sadly, it, it's not until people are forced to look at the reality of their own personal finances. Yes. <clears throat> and, and I always say, they, they won't come in to see me until the pain of staying the same and ignoring the bills and trying to do the balance transfers and mm. minimum payments until the pain of staying in that world become so great that the pain of changing or looking for options mm -hmm. is something that they're willing to entertain. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's the point at which many people come to see me. But they're focused on their immediate problem, and we can deal with that right. very effectively. There are lots of options. Federal law provides us ways not to pay bills that shouldn't be paid that people intentionally ignore because they have preconceived notions that if to do so is somehow um, embarrassment, embarrassment <clears throat> a character flaw, mm -hmm. they're doing something wrong. But if they can get over that and they see that the answer to their debt problems lies right in front of them, that's still just the beginning. Hmm. Because dealing with the debt is, well, we often re hear bankruptcy referred to as a fresh start. Yes, we do. Okay, and it is. But you have to finish what you start. Bankruptcy is designed for debt relief and nothing more. It doesn't do anything to help my clients rebuild their credit. It doesn't do mm -hmm. anything to help them understand what goes into their credit score. It doesn't teach them how to read their credit report so they can identify and, and dispute mm -hmm. incorrect information that hurts them. None of us, I don't know about you, but I wasn't taught any of this in school. Oh my goodness, <clears throat> I, I learned it um, as a practicing banker not as a person who was in academia or studying this stuff. When you got boots on the ground, then you realize, oh my words, nobody told me this. 
nobody told me this. And, and most people don't know it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, if you don't know what you don't know, that can be a real problem. Right, it is. Right, it is. So long ago, I set about trying to address this void. Mm -hmm. Many of my, my fellow attorneys were practicing bankruptcy law, helping to deal with the debt, and that's how I started out. Mm -hmm. But I began to realize, and it was through personal experience, mm -hmm. my own personal financial failure, mm -hmm. that I needed to find the answer. Right. And so I created a program for me. Okay. And now I have transformed that into finishing what you start after you file the bankruptcy and get the debt under control. Mm -hmm. What's next? Well, what is next? You have to begin at the beginning. And what I mean by that okay. is, <laughs> generally speaking, if you file a bankruptcy, or even if you don't sometimes, mm -hmm. your credit is either non-existent mm -hmm. or it's poor. Now, okay. those two things are not the same, and mm -hmm. I know you're aware of this, mm -hmm. but a lot of people mm -hmm. aren't. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, let me, let me give you an example. I'll pull someone's credit report. Okay. Because I'm licensed to pull credit reports mm -hmm. and I can do that. And there's no score. Insufficient credit data. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means it's, it's worse in many cases than having a poor score. At least you got a score. At least you got something to work with. Right. Mm -hmm. So insufficient data. There's no score there. So some people have either poor scores or no score mm -hmm. at all. You got to start from the very, very beginning. And so what I do is I teach, well, what do you do? What's the step? There are lots of programs that have lots of information. But what I found my clients really needed is a concise check the box, fill in the blank, mm -hmm. do the step, and A flow move chart on. and, and yeah. an execution a timeline. A step-by-step guide. Okay. So, what, so where do we start? A secured credit card. Okay. How do you get them? Well, there are lots of them out there. A lot of people go to Credit Karma mm -hmm. and they sign up for that. Mm -hmm. Credit Karma also gives you a score, but it's important for everybody to know that it's not a FICO score you're getting. It's a Vantage score. There are two different scoring models and there are differences that are important, but you get a secured credit card. Now, a lot of people don't know what a secured credit card is. They think maybe it's like a debit card, but it's very, very different. Oh, right. These are fundamental differences that people need to have explained to them. So let's, let's kind of go over the, okay, the highlights. Okay, please do. A debit card is nothing more than a way to get to your bank account. Mm -hmm. It's no extension of credit. And so it doesn't help your score. You can have a debit card and use it, but it will not help your score at all. Right. It's not a credit card. A secured credit card is nothing more. It is a credit card, but it's backed up by a deposit that you have to keep in the bank. Typically, these deposits are anywhere from a minimum of $200 to up to 1000 or more. Mm -hmm. To get started, it's often necessary to start with a secured credit card. Okay. Okay. So and the interest rate is going to be. The interest rate will probably be on the high side. It's going to be high. Okay. Yeah. I say that's a cost of re restoring your credit. I think that's a reasonable expense. It, it it's going to pay off big time mm -hmm. later on. So yes. the, the if there's an annual fee and it's thirty five bucks, you know maybe that's acceptable. If the if the interest rate is twenty two percent, that's high. But remember you're starting. And what right. I like to do is I tell my clients, look, these are tools. You're not using these credit cards to get into debt and to create problems. Mm -hmm. You are using them as tools to create a higher credit score. Mm -hmm. So you start with a secured credit card. Now, timing is important. You don't want to go out and apply for five credit cards on the same day. Oh, no. You want to go out and get one and use it for a couple of months before mm -hmm. you get your next one. So what's your next one going to be? Maybe another secured credit card. Mm -hmm. Could be an unsecured credit card. But even if it's secured, you want to use them every month. Okay. Now, the FICO score, which is what we all think of typically as the credit score, yeah, although there do. are different models, the actual formula for a FICO score is a closely guarded secret. Nobody knows <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But mm -hmm. it's an algorithm. We don't yeah. have to know because there are only about five things that we care about. Mm -hmm. All of the details we can sort of leave to the side for now because we're starting at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things that people need to understand is time itself is an important component of credit recovery. So I tell people, if you're going to expect to get a 650 credit score, which is in the good range, don't expect it to happen in two weeks. 
it's probably going to take you about a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so time is so, important. Yeah, okay. Usage of the credit card. Mm -hmm. So when we get the secured credit card, we want to use it every single month at least once. Okay. So what I tell people to do, hey, you got to buy gas for your car, right? Use the card. Use the card. You got to buy groceries? Use, use the, the card. card. Okay, and then pay it down. Now, there are different approaches to paying it down. Some mm -hmm. people say it's better to pay it off. Mm -hmm. And the reason they say that is because if you have a zero balance, there won't be any interest to pay. Accrued. Mm -hmm. That may or may not be true because different cards will charge you daily averages. Yes, so, right. so that could or could not be true for a particular card. In my world, the bankruptcy clients mm -hmm. that I said, I tell them never pay it off. Always leave about a dollar or two something. or five. Leave something on there. There are lots of good reasons mm -hmm. for that we won't go into here. But whether you pay it off or you leave a dollar on, use it once a month. That's critical. It's critical because okay. credit card usage is a measure of your score. Okay. Even if you're charging $30, exactly. use it. Exactly. Right. Okay. Now, how much you charge on the card is also important. Hmm. And so what we want, want to have is a small portion of our allowable limit mm -hmm. used and, and not more. Okay. okay. This is called a utilization ratio. Okay. And it's important because what you want to do is you want to stay under about 30%. Okay. I say you know, about 10 to 30%. Leave most of it unused. That tells the credit card company, hey, here's a person who can manage this card not using it up, mm -hmm, maxing it mm -hmm, out, mm -hmm, abusing mm -hmm. the card. That person, because they have demonstrated an ability by using it monthly and not using it all up, is more credit worthy and then you're going to get an increase in your credit limit. Wonderful. Okay. Now that increase in your credit limit improves your utilization ratio, mm -hmm. makes you more credit worthy and it's easier then to get the next credit card. Okay. Okay. So how, how long does this go on? It goes on for the, about the next year. My clients, my recommendation, mm -hmm. I want everybody to have three to five cards. Mm, that many cards? Three of, yes. Even if they're not used? Well, I want them to be used every month. Okay. Okay. I don't want them ma maxed out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now people think that's a little bit excessive, but my goal is to raise the score. I got it. And as you have to look at possible. credit utilization. Yeah. Got so you it. have to use it. You have to wait the appropriate amount of time. You have to maintain your, your utilization mm -hmm, ratio. Mm -hmm. Importantly, never pay late. Oh, the sing that's the end. The single <laughs> industry. most damaging thing that you can do is pay late. It takes a long time to recover from mm -hmm. that. So uh, a little tip on that. Showing my age, I think, a little bit perhaps, but years ago I used to tell people, for a lot of good reasons, the credit counselor in me says, I want you to write out your bills every month and right. I want you to write them with your, with your pen and lick the envelope and put it in the mailbox. But you know what? Things have changed. Mm -hmm. And now I worry that that letter may not get there. And if it doesn't get there, what's going to happen? A late charge and, and, and your credit is going to tank. Well, you're not done. You're just mm -hmm. set back. Okay. Sometimes people do that. I have, you know, I've coached hundreds and hundreds of people. Right. Met with them every month. We pull up their credit scores and get on the phone and say, what did you do here and mm -hmm. what are you planning on doing there? And I know that sometimes it's going to happen. The payment comes in late. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. You can recover just a setback. So keep doing this month after month after month, getting three to five cards, making sure that you pay on time. Mm -hmm. So you're paying on time. Time itself is passing. Your utilization ratio is good. You've got a number of different cards. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe the next thing you're going to do is get a car loan. Okay. Okay. Or some maybe an installment loan. Okay. The different kinds of credit are what's referred to as a mix of credit. Mm -hmm. And so the different kinds of credit actually also help your score. What, can I interrupt? And I need you to tell our viewers what an installment loan is because we're talking a language that many people Good point. may not be familiar with. Good point. Okay. So when I say installment loan, mm -hmm. well, let's compare it to a credit card, which is an right. open-ended revolving line of credit. No, there's a fixed limit, but you could make all kinds of charges. Mm -hmm. In an installment loan, what I mean by that is you go to a bank and you borrow $500. 
Now, I don't mean go to a cash land. <laughs> that's that's no. off limits for my clients. Right, right. But go to a bank. Okay. Now, while we're on the subject of banking, mm -hmm. sometimes a good place to get a credit card is to go to a bank and say, hey, I'm recovering my credit. I would like to open up an account with you, but I want to know if you'll give me a credit card. Mm -hmm. If I put up some money on a deposit, can I get a credit card? And how about an installment loan once I've been here? Mm -hmm. Shop around because banks are businesses. They're all over the place. They're everywhere. They're just all over the place today. So the installment loan is a fixed amount that you make fixed payments on. Mm -hmm. And so maybe get one for a year or 18 months and, and put it into your budget and make sure that you make the payments on time. So that installment loan is a different kind of credit product from the credit cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the mix of credit, the different kinds of credit, also help your score. Okay. Okay. A car loan would do the same thing. It's okay. a different kind of loan. And of course, if you've got a house payment that's being reported, that's a different kind. So all mm -hmm. of these different types added together help boost your score. Okay. So now none of this is complicated. We've discussed it in less than five minutes. But somehow, um, and I know we've been very transparent with one another, but I think the consumer still flounders with fear and misinformation. And, and I'm saying that because the credit and banking industry, actually the financial services industry, going from insurance, medical, uh, banking, it's a closed industry. And, and truthfully, it, they don't want the consumers to know how they, it works. I'm just telling you. Uh, they really do not want people to know how this works. Because if people are empowered with that kind of information, um, things begin to change. They begin to change one family at a time, but they do begin to change. It, it, and that's true. You would probably not be surprised how many new clients I get that wouldn't have really thought about using my services mm -hmm. or exploring bankruptcy options, but for their neighbor or friend or mm -hmm. coworker who is absolutely experiencing a life-changing for the better event. Right. And they notice, well, what's going on in your world? Right. All of a right. sudden, you seem to be a very happy and different person. Right. Well, without debt killing you, you would be. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's contagious in that, and mm -hmm. that's what you're talking about, you know, one family at a time. Mm -hmm. There's another thing, too, and it's just because we're human beings, I think. I have found that I wrote a book years ago where I condensed all of my, my procedures and my, my thinking on this, and I used to give it to my clients. Mm -hmm. but you, you gave me that book. But, but they wouldn't years read ago. it mm -hmm. or they wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. okay? We get busy. You know, we get distracted. Yeah. And so what I found is... The, the, the necessary thing to make this really work mm -hmm. is to put it into a program where people are given steps. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you a long list of things to do and you can understand it perfectly, but the odds of your getting it done go up dramatically if I give you one thing to do right, and say, I'll check back with you next month mm -hmm. and we'll see how you're mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. And then you're thinking, ah, Rick's going to be calling me next month. I better make sure I get this done. Right. Next month it's done. And so, okay, we'll go the next month. It works so much better. And I so, bet it does. And I that's why I don't give that book out anymore. <laughs> Instead, I enroll my clients in the monthly program and they get automatic reminders. And so it's like eating an elephant. You can do it one bite at a time. You can recover your credit mm -hmm. one month at a time if someone is handing you one small assignment mm -hmm. that you can do instead of a big book to read, say, do it all. Let me ask you a question because we do know that the primary cause of bankruptcy based on statistics, and you can correct, correct me, the primary was money, and then followed by medical uh, occurrences. Medical bills, uh, definitely, and I'm seeing, sadly, more and more people being sued by medical bills, not by the providers, but it seems like the insurance companies, uh, well, I don't know who's making the decision, honestly, but medical bills mm -hmm. get turned over to collections quickly. Yeah, they sell them off. They sell them off. They, they, they just sell them off, the same as banks. Everybody's, <clears throat> you know, routing that stuff to collection agencies. I monitor lawsuits uh, of my clients, and mm -hmm. I can tell you at any given time who's the hot creditor suing 
the consumers. Whoa. And I can tell you that I've noticed a dramatic increase in medical lawsuits. Where a collection agency represented on retainer oh, yeah. by an attorney, because he's not a part of that organization, right. but he does um, uh, file suits. Is it perhaps, Richard, because in Ohio, the statute of limitations is so jacked up. Can, and we can talk, tell them what that is, because I don't want to start talking legalese. Mm. But I have been told by attorneys in other states that Ohio, you don't have to have a good address. You don't have to have much of anything. You can file last known address, and it's an enforceable contract for garnishment seizure, et cetera. Ohio does have one of the longer statutes of limitation. Now let's talk about what is that. Okay, okay please is, for the benefit so, of consumer. Incidentally, viewers, I didn't know any of this until I had a friend that went through this who actually incurred a debt in, in, in Pennsylvania, in college, relocated, and she wound up owing almost $10,000 on a little bitty $500 student credit card. Happens all the time. I couldn't believe it. Right. Explain that, please. Okay, so, so when you have a debt. Okay. Let's just say it's a $500 medical bill. Yeah. And you can't pay it, you get sued. How long does the creditor have to sue you? In Ohio, that's eight years. Got it. Eight years Eight to sue years you. So to you sue could you. have long forgotten about this, mm -hmm. and then you get a lawsuit, and it's generally not from the original creditor. It's mm -hmm. not from the hospital you went to. It's they from sold it to somebody Some else. company mm -hmm. you probably don't even recognize. Mm -hmm. And there are rights you have to force them to produce the documentation and all of that. But it's eight years they've got. Mm. Now, here's, here's, and this is what your friend was talking about. Once they have the judgment, they can takes, practically speaking, forever to collect it. All they have to do in some states is to renew that judgment, or if it goes what they call dormant, mm -hmm. they can revive it. Oh something. my gosh, so they, I, I had like a, a dog. I had a client <laughs> that came in just <laughs> last week with a $7,500 bill. Uh, actually, it was her son out, out of high school, uh -huh. had, um, almost 15 years ago, 15 it was a years ago, $500 uh -huh. bill. Now it's $7,500. I couldn't believe this yeah. girl. It was almost $10,000 on a $500 Chase credit card sure. that they were pushing to college students back in the day. They don't do mm. that anymore. I think they don't. But uh, it was just mass enrollment. Everybody got credit cards. And she said, I, I didn't pay it. I was... 18 years old, I just didn't pay it. And then she mm -hmm. went on and they surely did find her, but the bill was no longer $500. No, because it, it accrues interest forever. Forever. Yeah. At the interest rate that it was offered or no. what? No, what happens is the, the you, oh, when, when you're is, sued, oh, good Lord. when you're sued, Oof. the interest rate will change upon the issuance of a judgment. So, if the interest rate on the credit card was 18 percent, mm -hmm. you get a judgment amount. Okay, we'll say 500. Now, at that point in time, the 18 percent ends, and then what's called statutory interest takes over, and so the judgment bears interest under Ohio law in Ohio and other laws, other states whatever the state says that interest rate is, and it goes up and down, okay, so. But it continues to It continues accrue. to run. It doesn't freeze the amount, it continues to run. Now here's the, the, the sneaky thing that a lot of people get bitten on is without any not notice to anyone, the creditor can file this judgment and it will attach to real estate. So you, you have one of these lawsuits as a kid, you forget about it, you grow up, mm -hmm. you get married, you buy a house, and then you're ready to sell the house, and then and your title examiner says, oh, well, there's a lien on your house. You say, what are you talking about? Well, this uh, old judgment was filed by the creditor, unbeknownst to you, because there's no notice requirement. No notice requirement. And it's attached to your real estate. And now you have to pay it out of the proceeds of your 
real estate sale or we won't approve the sale. Happens all the time. Oh. That's called passive debt collection. <laughs> passive debt. And then people, this is why I said we have to blow this whole thing up so that people can get over the stigma associated with their uh, losses and recognize that I got to protect my family, which is my business. I have a business. My wife, my children, or my husband, my children. I got to protect my stuff. Because they are literally, busily proceeding with the strength of the law behind them. Oh, yeah. This is not illegal activity. Not at all. And, and as you've mentioned Ooh, earlier, the, my goodness gracious. The, the business of debt collection is a ruthless and heartless one. They don't care if you're an 80-year-old woman and they're taking away your home. They don't I was care. There. Uh, they don't care. It's, it's not a relationship. It's all dollars and cents. It's, it's as cold as it can be. It is so cold. So when, if more people would, as you say, start looking at their families as a business and making prudent business decisions, mm -hmm. and if they see that they need a financial recovery, then find the right person, mm -hmm. find the right program, and then get started. You know, here we are at the beginning of 2018. And you know we're always making New Year's resolutions. Mm -hmm. One of the things we could do is resolve to take action on our own personal personal affairs. Well, interestingly enough, that you bring that up because my show for next year, my starting show, is going to deal with just that, which is back to basics. Your home is your business, mm -hmm. and um, despite what people think, you may work for a company, but you also own your own company. Well, yeah, we all really are our own financial managers. We are. And we need to think of ourselves that way, but we don't, you know. Right, because well, because we haven't been taught, and the system is so designed where you cannot know. I mean, I've been in that industry. I started in that industry at uh, the grand old age of 21. Wow. I Yeah, and um, actually buying banks. <laughs> what I did. Uh, mergers and acquisitions. I mean, uh, in the day. And absolutely, it took me to actually get into the inner workings of a bank to realize why they have all the money. Because they have extracted it from everybody. As the one manager, uh, one executive told me, he said, oh, those poor suckers. I mean, I, mean, I said, but you're talking about my family. And me. You, and me. Right. You, you, I'm not a poor sucker. <laughs> but this is that system. And this is why I'm glad to know, at least, that we do have the full force of the legal apparatus that is in place to allow you to file bankruptcy as your first step to the road to uh, financial I'm recovery. So, I'm so glad you say that because everybody comes to see me and, and they, they say something akin to, you know, this is the last straw. You know, oh my this, goodness. This is, I'm, yeah. at, I'm at my rock bottom. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have any options. It's so sad because if they would move that starting mm -hmm, point up mm -hmm. in their lives, before you run out of all the options, take a look at them before you get there. Mm -hmm. um, people typically don't because I said before, the, the pain of the change is more than the pain oh, of staying the, the same. That, that familiar, even though it's not good, at least it's the familiar mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you're not venturing out into mm -hmm. seeing some strange attorney in an office and you know nobody wants to do that and it's scary. But if they would move that uh, that starting point up a little mm -hmm. bit, uh, that would be a whole lot better. They would not waste uh, thousands of dollars. They would not waste oh years gosh. of their lives. Mm -hmm. And if they started to reframe how they look at things mm -hmm. in terms of a business, I mean, they'd be so much better off. The, one of the things that I like to tell people, and this is sort of a, I never hear it expressed, but it's very, very true. Going through a financial reorganization People often ask me, well, do you offer credit counseling in addition to this? And I say, I don't. I can refer you if you feel you need to, but let me tell you something. The process of going through analyzing your own finances mm -hmm. and looking at it this way 
has an effect automatically on people. I believe they it become does. more aware of the inflow of money and the outflow mm -hmm. of money. Right. You know, they just become naturally aware of it because they look at it differently for the first time in their lives. I totally, you know, you bring up such a, a very powerful, powerful point, and that is that awareness, which is a big thing with me, which is if you understood the voices you listen to, the credibility you give to very non-credible voices, mm -hmm. and we are programmed in so many ways to process these things as being honest, helpful, useful, and it's none of the above. It's about pushing forth someone else's agenda. And certainly in the area of finances and credit, it's, it's full front there. And you are right, when a person begins to take a hold of their money, and, and, and I'm going to say this for the benefit of you viewers, listen to me. The wrong time to call me is when you're getting ready to retire and you only have $25,000 in the bank. That's what they say is the average retiree is bringing into retirement. And I look at their portfolio of life. As I say, all the things they've done, they bought cars, they've done this, they've done that. And at the end of the road, they are trying to retire because they're broken down emotionally, physically, psychologically, and they only got $25,000. And I'm gonna tell you something, Rich. They ask me, where did my money go? And I tell them, well, let's go and start looking at your HUD one for your house. Mm -hmm. Let's start with that. Let's see how much money you, you gave away for this thing you had to have called a house, called a mortgage, because you didn't pay for it cash. You didn't accelerate payments. So over the course of the, the mortgage, you paid the bank two to three times more than the house was worth. Right. Then let's look at all your cars that you did, and let's look at your financing of your vacations because you didn't have the cash at 21 to 26 percent interest, which is, you know, 25 percent of your uh, credit card has gone to somebody else. And at the end of the road, and this is what is so painful to me, and I know you have the same sentiments. At the end of the road, they don't have anything. They don't have anything. They don't, they can't even retire with the comfort and the knowledge that, can I get old without being broke? And this is why I really do believe that if we can begin to um, enlighten them to a point of execution, which is, now I told you this, now you need to do it. You need to do it. If you're on that path, halt, time out, back it up. What do you need to do? And I will tell so many people what you need to do is forget credit counseling. I know you're, you're, you're licensed, but you need to just cut your losses and just get moving. Would you like to know why I became a licensed credit counselor? I would like to know why you did that, because I didn't know that. I'll tell you. Okay. Because I got so despondent and sad seeing people come to me after being in credit counseling and not making any progress. And I didn't feel that because I wasn't a licensed credit counselor, I couldn't really comment mm -hmm. one way or the other because I didn't have the credentials. Okay. I was an attorney but not a credit counselor. So I said, I'm, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to cover all the bases so that when someone comes to see me, mm -hmm. there will be no doubt about the, the advice. Okay. So I became a licensed credit counselor. And then, so when, when they said, I I'm in a credit counseling, I said, oh really? Who put you in here? Because you shouldn't be here. Okay. The reason is, credit counselor wasn't also a licensed debt arbitrator. Okay. So I became a debt arbitrator. Okay, so who put you in this debt arbitration plan? Well, this people did. Well, they sh you shouldn't be there. Let me tell okay, you why. Okay, right. Let me show you why. <laughs> so then I became a board-certified bankruptcy specialist because there's, there's no higher certification than that. So all of these things I bring to bear mm -hmm. to explain to someone why they should have this option or that. And sometimes people come to me thinking that they need to file a bankruptcy, and they don't. And mm -hmm. I tell them, you know, you need to be over here because this is where your best result's going gonna mm -hmm. to come from. But one of the things I wanted to, uh, to mention is the awareness. Mm -hmm. I am seeing an increasing number of people who come in, 
they file bankruptcy, and they suddenly realize they don't need that big car. Yeah. They don't need to finance vacations. Sometimes they say, well, you know, if I can't afford to buy it, maybe I, I need to think twice about whether I really need it. Yeah. Sometimes people come in. I was just talking to somebody today. She says to me, you know, I bought this house, but I really don't think that I should have this house with the maintenance yeah. and all the Home taxes is, is and all a that. Work. I said, you know what? Mm -hmm. You might be better off scaling back and renting something and putting the difference in your retirement plan. That would be nice. <laughs> and I see more and more people happier and, and more satisfied with less in terms of material because they're, they, they've been bitten. Mm -hmm. They bought, they drank the Kool-Aid. Oh yeah, they drank the, they drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah, I gotta they, have this because. I gotta have it, why? Cause, 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 I, 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 I gotta have it. I'm like, but why? And they realize right. that they don't. Yeah. And so the, the people that come to you with $25,000 saying, I need to retire next I, year, I, 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 oh they're learning God. in bankruptcy that they don't need to have the expensive house, expensive car, and, and the, the big fancy vacation. And they can be happy with less, I living trust below me, you your be, means. You, you will, I believe this uh, personally. Phyllis, in fact, people say, you know, Michelle is, is, is just frugal. And I tell them, um, yeah, I am. I am because I'd rather see it in my pocket than in their pocket. And so I make those decisions in every aspect of my life. Now, I did spend a lot of money educating my children through private schools. But my children will tell you the trade-off was for that $18,000 a year tuition tab per child, their clothing came from thrift stores. I bought clothing from thrift stores and had the clothing altered because the rich do donate to thrift stores mm -hmm. <laughs> and had their clothing altered, had uh, things cleaned, and uh, they dressed like everybody else because nobody's going to look at the tag on your outfit. And I tell folks so that now that I am at a place where I am uh, comfortably retired, I still don't blow money because it's a habit. I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to put money in somebody else's pocket. I understand how credit works in this country and interest will kill you. It's just, it's not even a kind way to talk about it. Interest will kill you. Debt will strangle you. And I don't care how long you've lived in your house and that's on you too, Rick. It's not ever your house because if you stop making tax payments, whose house is it? It goes to the government. If you are having trouble with the IRS, yeah. Whose house is it? So when people tell me, well, you know, I, my home is this, and I said, just recognize that the stripping process has begun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and if you're okay with it, because you're aware, no secrets, you're aware, then fine. But don't, but don't sit up on a perch feeling that you've arrived. Don't do that because you may find yourself as an older person having real problems. You're right about that. And, and one of the awareness factors mm -hmm. that, that we talk about in my office a lot is, <clears throat> is when I look at a budget, mm -hmm. it goes to the interest. They say, well, I can afford this payment. I can afford this payment. Um, well, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, you're, you're focusing on the wrong thing. How much of that payment is doing you any good? How much of it goes to the purchase? How much of it goes to interest? It goes to the banking industry. Right, right. <clears throat> we are somehow, well, we have, many of us have become, uh, uh, can I afford the monthly payment frame of mind when we should be thinking, do I want to take on this amount of debt and what is it going to cost me in terms of an interest rate? Over the life of the Over loan. Over the life of the loan. Yes. And so one of the things that I try to point out to my clients is the effort you spend in rebuilding your credit improves your credit score, mm -hmm. which reduces the interest rate, right. which lowers the cost of everything you buy. Right. All of this works together. Let's take the money away from the banks and keep it. Well, that's where I'm at, and I speak as an um, uh, enlightened let me use that term, enlightened banker, that it, people always say, what's the best investment? 
I said, don't spend your money. That's a hundred percent return. Yeah. It's all in your pocket. Make decisions that say you understand that principle, that I'd rather keep it in my pocket than to see it go to someone who could care less. Do you own stock in that bank? That's my first thing. What's your equity stake in that bank or that credit institution uh, that would make you uh, so aggressively engaged in going into a lot of debt? Because surely, surely, you could not be willing to pay 26 cents on a dollar. Could, really, you couldn't be willing to do that unless you had some kind of equity or stock. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right. But <clears throat> another thing, too, that I like to, to turn people's mm -hmm. mind around, what about the equity stake in your own ha household business? Oh, my. How much do you I have in the Can I get a high five? Yes. Bam. Thank you. How much do you have in savings yourself? Yes. Most families don't have more than $1,500. A major catastrophe, car accident, medical issue, would put them under. Got okay. that. And so... When I look at a family that has nothing left over, I, I, I don't even bother to ask the question. I know they don't have any savings. Right, right. And you also know that their stress level is off the chart, which opens the door for sickness. Yep. I'm not a doctor, but, but. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a proven scientific fact that being in debt causes stress and excess stress causes illness. Everybody knows this. It's yes. beyond question. And, and I see it coming in. A lot of people are suffering from this sort of mm -hmm. compound problem. See, debt problems don't exist in isolation. It poisons the whole family. Right. It poisons the person, their relationships with their, their significant others. The whole family suffers because of debt. Right. And, and the, the credit industry seems to be <laughs> <laughs> somewhat <laughs> ignorant of this or they don't care. Oh, <clears throat> they don't care. So it's up to us. They're alligators. It's up to they us to mm -hmm. take control of our own lives. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to do it for us. And I'm, and I'm glad you say that. Um, I had one other question because I know that time is moving on. If you don't want a complete wipeout of all your debt, which is known as the Chapter 7, mm -hmm. is there another uh, bankruptcy? Uh, talk about the, is it the, th the 13. Yeah, let's talk about 13. Okay, back to our hypothetical family. We've got a family yeah. size of four. Now, the family size of four, median income is 83500 okay. So let's just say we got $100,000 coming in. Okay. Okay. Now, you might think at first blush, well, if you got 100000 coming in, you mm -hmm. can pay all your debts. What's the problem? Generally not true. Generally not true because mm -hmm. people with higher incomes tend to have higher expenses. They mm -hmm. have a little a bit of a larger mm -hmm. house mm -hmm. and maybe not extravagant, but they have higher expenses. And so the amount they have left over for um, dealing with credit card debt is often just as small as someone who has a below median mm -hmm. income. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad you brought up the Chapter 13 because it is, it is the most powerful but misunderstood form of debt relief that exists. Let mm. me tell you what I mean. Okay. If you ask the average person, what's a Chapter 13 bankruptcy? They will tell you something like this. A Chapter 13 bankruptcy is that kind of bankruptcy where you pay back all of your debt through a trustee. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some truth in that, but part of it's not true either. Okay. The part that's not true, or at least not always true, or mostly not true, is pay back all of your debt. I file Chapter 13s that look better than 7s. And when I say better wow. than 7s, here's what I mean by that. In Chapter 7, zero cents on the dollar gets paid to unsecured creditors. Okay. I can put together a Chapter 13 and have my judge approve it that pays back one cent on the unsecured creditors. So how different are these plans? Okay? Okay. All right. So I want to hear more. This is interesting. Now I take my family's car mm -hmm. that has a high interest loan. They're paying 24%. Okay. I'm going to change that interest rate to 6. Come on. Their car is going to be paid. Are you paid serious? At, absolutely. The federal secured debt interest rate for cars is 6%. doesn't matter whether it's 22, 24, it 18. It matter. goes to 6. There's more. Okay. What if that family comes to me and they've got a car that's about two and a half years old? Mm -hmm. It's 
it's worth about five grand. Okay. And they owe ten. Okay. That happens that all the time. That happens all the time. All the time, it right? It happens all the time. Okay, yes. their payment on this car is probably going to be around three seventy-five. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make their car payment two hundred and thirty bucks, and they're going to pay five grand on the car, not ten. Okay, that's called a cram down. Are you serious? This is legal? Absolutely, and it's always been this way. Well, it's wait a minute, let me understand you. The car market value is 10. No, the no, car is five. The car's market value is five. The debt is 10. The debt is 10, so you've got a negative 5K right. deficiency. The court will allow you to cram it down to five? Right, and you're gonna pay that five at 6% interest. Oh my goodness. So you keep gracious. the car. You keep your car. Keep your car. But instead of paying 375 a month, you're paying 230. Well, that gives you excess income automatically. Now you can afford to heat the house, pay for your prescriptions. Yes. And buy clothes for the kids. Yes. You didn't lose anything. Versus a seven where the car is Oh my goodness gracious. Well, in a seven, you have a choice. You could either keep the car and choose to pay 10 for it. I would probably say, don't do that. Don't it's a bad do idea. That. <laughs> um, but you can't cram it down in a seven, but that you can do this in a 13. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of things you can do in a chapter 13. The main reason people file 13s, they get behind in their house payments because ah. a, a 13 will stop a foreclosure mm -hmm. and allow you up to five years to catch up your missed payments so you don't lose your home. Now, you know what? That is so good. And I just saw my executive producer say, we've only got five minutes left. And we haven't even gotten, well, we're, it's better than the first show. At least we've got two shows of good, comprehensive information. Give your phone number information, how to reach you. You can contact me um, at 937-748-1749. Say it again. 937-748-1749. You don't have to remember that. Go to the website, debtfreeohio.com, and all my contact information is there, debtfreeohio.com. And for those of you that are outside of the Ohio market that need somebody like him, please be aware that he provides referral attorneys in other states as well. And um, again, sorry you're not in Ohio, what can I say? But they've got some good guys and gals in Kentucky, Indiana, and other surrounding states where this show does air that can, in fact, provide you with good sound uh, advice. Welcome to the fascinating world of financial recovery. And as we conclude the year 2017, looking forward, <laughs> Oh, I feel like I've been on the Mojave Desert as a flamingo trying to get home. Looking forward to 2018. And all I can say to those of you as we move on, I sure wish I knew this kind of stuff. I sure wish I had this kind of information uh, when I was going through my circumstances. And all I can say to you is I thank you again for being a part of my world. And again, in moving forward, Sending you my love, sending you my prayers, wishing you and your family a joyous, joyous, joyous season of hope, and I'll see you around. You take care. God bless you.